Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, 720 million people across the world are hungry. The Russia-Ukraine war has exacerbated an already fragile situation. The United Nations Secretary General Antonio Cortares has been speaking of how millions of more people could be pushed to the edge of food insecurity, how several parts of the globe in just a few months from now could potentially be looking at famine. What is the role that emerging technologies and innovation can play in trying to help build resilient supply chains? And how do we make these technologies available to small and marginal farmers in places like Asia, in Africa? To talk about what is, in any case, a very critical issue, but also a very immediate issue. We're joined this morning by public and private stakeholders. Allow me to welcome to the last day at the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Minister for Chemicals and Fertilizers from India, one of the bright stars of the Modi government, Mansukh Bhai Mandavia. Welcome, Minister. Thank you. Flanking him, Swento Holster, President and Chief Executive Officer of Yara International, one of the world's leading fertilizer companies. They've revolutionized agriculture 100 years ago. Is there a new revolution that can be powered by technology? Leanne Giel joins us, Executive Vice President, General Counsel, Corporate Governance and Compliance at Nestle. Uh, at the cutting edge of using technological innovations to change the way farming is being done. Can these be taken then to places in Africa and Asia as well? Uh, we've also got Ishmael Shunga, Chief Executive Officer, South African Confederation of Agricultural Unions for a perspective from farmers. Is it really about cutting edge technology or are there more real world solutions which can provide the innovation that we're all looking for? Um, you're all welcome to participate. You can go on the Slido app, share your questions. I'll take some of those questions as this session wears on. But can I start by asking Shwen to explain the criticality of the challenge as you see it in terms of the global food grains crisis that stares us in the face, the scenario as you see unfold over the next few months, and solutions that you think need to be considered and worked on by everyone who's listening to this conversation. Well, uh, thank you, and, and, and uh, yes, we're faced with a, a dual challenge now, both a, a food crisis, but also an, uh, a climate crisis, and, and we need to solve uh, both of them. Um, Yara is uh, operating in, in 60 countries. We, we sell our products to 160 countries, and, and, uh, and the reports we're getting back from the, from the front lines now in, in the most vulnerable uh, communities uh, are, are just uh, scary in terms of, uh, of the impact uh, now on, on food uh, production and food uh, affordability and potentially also on uh, availability. Uh, in, indeed, the, the Russia's uh, invasion of uh, Ukraine has um, accelerated this and uh, creating significant disturbances to, to value chains that have been built up over over decades, uh, and, and World Food System actually has done a fairly good job at growing more food for a growing population, though at a cost to the environment. But now with, um, with trade flows changing uh, overnight, uh, that uh, creates uh, uh, complexities that in turn also has a direct impact on, on, uh, on food flows. Uh, Ukraine and Russia are big producers of, uh, of food. Uh, right now there are 25 million tons of uh, corn and grain in, uh, in, in, in the Ukrainian ports that, uh, are, that, that is not reaching the, the, the market. So at the same time as we're talking about uh, famine, uh, we risk food uh, rotting in uh, inventories in, uh, in Ukraine as a direct result of the, of the war. And uh, that's up to uh, just an in the individual to, to, to make it a change to that. And here I can only plead to humanity to, to resolve that and, and hope that it changes, but we cannot rely on, on hope alone. We need to, to, to put other measures in, in place, strengthening the, 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 the safety nets and the, the lost safety nets that are out there, like the, the World Food Program, and also dealing with the longer term or medium term challenges of the, of the food system. Um, 
today um, uh, it represents 25 to 30 percent of greenhouse uh, gas emissions, uh, and, and we need to solve that uh, as well to make farming also more resilient to climate change because that is part of what is happening now. If you look at the the heat waves in uh, in India and the impact now on on, on the current wheat uh, harvest on, on in Pakistan in. Uh, in, in North America with, um, with also first cold spell and now heat, drou droughts and floods and so on. Uh, agriculture is directly impacted by, by climate change and, and we need to do that as well. And then it's about technology. Uh, our company was founded 120 years ago based on a technology, uh, technological breakthrough. Our founder was the first one that came up with the innovation to, to sequester and get nitrogen out of the air and turn it into fertilizer to, to feed a growing population. And that's had a huge impact on both on, on the ag sector but also the, uh, on a growing population. Now, the next step will be on, on technology and, and data and transparency and availability through regenerative farming, which I think is uh, key here, that we're, we have an output-focused uh, ag system that measures and, and, and really rewards farmers for uh, farming in the right way so that they get paid for something else than just a kilo of a crop. Uh, what we have now is uh, exactly what we paid for uh, in, in the food system, a food system only focused on kilos produced, not the environmental impact, uh, um, productivity, nutritional content, water, water consumption, carbon sequestration, all of that has been, uh, to, to, and I'm talking a bit broadly here of course, but that's been disregarded and then we're left with, um, with kilos of crop with the environmental consequences that has. So we have to f uh, use the dual challenge now to urgently change and help on food security, get more food to people, but at the same time, solve the environmental challenges. And, and that's where technology plays an important role. So nitrogen as fertilizer is a big idea. Is there a particular big idea that you're most passionate about championing at this moment? Or do you think it's a collection of small ideas that could potentially swing transform agriculture? Because the challenges that we're dealing with are A, immediate, uh, and also long term. So there's structural and immediate challenges that we're dealing with simultaneously. Yeah, so, so, so um, you know, there are, um, there's not just one thing that will solve everything, but, but it starts with regenerative agriculture that we start to agree on what is really the definition of that so we can start to invest and build a structure around it and create the predictability for the farmers, but also the input providers and the, 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 the food companies and the retailers, the whole value chain, so we have predictability on, on what that uh, is. And, and I think we have enough in place to, to, to really go, uh, go ahead with that. But then to, to, to use um, uh, technology, like uh, it, it could be sensor technology, both uh, whether it's on tractors, hand, handheld devices, what we can do now on satellite technology to get the, the, the power and, and agronomical competence that in the past would only be available to, to large-scale farmers. We can do that now with smartphones to give that, in the, that power in the hand of the, of the farmer to make these optimal decisions. And, and, uh, uh, and that requires, uh, of course, uh, a predictability, uh, but also a willingness to implement the measures that uh, allow that and full value chain partnerships. It doesn't help if, uh, if we have premium fertilizer targeted if there is no demand for it or if, if the farmers cannot afford it. Uh, but, but it is possible. The cost to decarbonize food, uh, and that's calculated by Boston Consulting Group, is 4%. It's a very small number. It seems, it seems easy to absorb, but it, yet it's so difficult if we put the entire burden on the farmers. We cannot do that. This has to be a full value chain, and technology will help to make it visible and, and, and also to enable that. Minister Mandavia, one of the challenges in countries like India is the fact that land holdings are becoming smaller. You've got water tables that are depleting and making technology available at price points which farmers can afford. How are you and your government working towards addressing this challenge? It is uh, important questions because India is a big country, huge diversity, 1.3 billion populations and half populations on depend on farming. And uh, farming scale is going very, very little. So the farm size is 
very low and so it's a very challenge that we we are implement to technology because individual farmers have used this technology and they have no financial situations so we have taken to number of initiatives to government level that uh, holistic approach we have done farmers get fertilizer in cheaper rate farmers get uh, digital information as well as veda as as well the nutrient deficiency soil health card all type of service provide to central government and government provide this services so the farmers of uh, farmers of uh, farmers has no more expenses and so we are doing try continuously that our farmers uh, production is uh, continuously increase so last 5 years ago honorable our prime minister told that we want to uh, we want to doubling income of our farmers and so the we are pushing to drip irrigations given to subsidy we are pushing to uh, fertilizer we are giving to subsidy we are using to number of type of alternate fertilizer and giving to subsidy so the small and marginal farmers have no problem they are working for, for very well and they have also support technical support financial <coughs> supports and a uh, small farmers have required to to farmings of uh, bank of uh, bank finance micro finance we are also available to stop support to uh, our government so our um, our, our farmer size is going down cut but our production is increasing now and today one of the biggest themes at the world economic forum in davos this year minister has been the fear of famine especially in africa and india could have played a role uh, or can still play a role by exporting some wheat and your government in april was speaking about doing that in may you changed your mind a lot of people sitting here would wonder at a time when there's a very real prospect of famine globally uh why would you put up these walls instead of opening the doors and feeding those who need food desperately at this time it is a uh, important questions because india's role every time our philosophy our indian philosophy is vasudev kutumbakam means whole family the whole world is one family so you see during covid crisis <coughs> india was under lockdown first wave and second wave but at that time the world have required to medicine no have medicine in globally crisis was done at that time in this situations under lockdown india we have started to we india have a 3000 pharma companies and 10000 pharma manufacturing unit we have given to lockdown pass and we our uh, honorable prime minister appealed to our industrialist that you are start and continuous production ramp up fill uh, foot over requirement and supply to globally at that time every day five to seven plane land in india only carry by medicine so and we have supplied to 150 countries medicine not only supply to medicine but we have not taken to over charges we follow to our responsibility commerce next first service and at that time we have supplied to affordable medicine in in globally and as well as the food crisis my my country always believe we are responsible country we of the food grains our with the big country 1.3 our own 1.3 billion population is our own populations our requirement is much more but our export share only 1.1.5% but my humble request to globally we are follow to our responsi responsibility we should try in my country to ramp up production in food grains and all other globally country comes to one platforms these how their share is much more they are also responsible for needy countries it is 
my humble request because it's all our responsibility. Any countries, any persons have not get to grant food. Food security, it's not good. So Indian behavior, India is always responsible behavior and committed to globally and support to all country, every time, everywhere. Ishmael, uh, Africa has the maximum of arable land in the world and yet the maximum amount of challenges for food grain production are on the continent. Shwen gave us his sense of the challenges that we see in the next few months. Before we get to the long-term structural challenges, could you explain how you see the situation in Africa and how uh, possibly technology or innovation could play some kind of a role in trying to ramp up uh, food grain production? Thanks, Rao. Um, technology is an important factor in um, the transformation of agriculture in Africa and I believe in developing countries. But sometimes we see technology not in its proper context. And I just want to maybe start also by saying that the problems of the war are just a compounding effect. Maybe it's the marginal increase in the pain that farmers face is not as high because they've always had shortages anyway. So, so, so they've been dealing with it, with, with, with the war, without the war, with COVID, without COVID. So the starting point really is, is should, be, should be clear that it has been a long-term problem. And uh, what is panning out now is much more the agency of addressing it. And technology plays an important role. But context matters. Technology should be at the service of, of farmers. And, and it should be able to help solve their problems. And their problems, quite, quite frankly, can be very basic, and, and yet the solutions can be very profound uh, from where they're coming. And it begs the question, what are the problems? Let me just quickly map out my thinking about what the problems are. Um, agriculture itself has become more science-driven. Um, ICT and airboard has become more complex, data-driven knowledge intensive, information intensive, you name it, that's what it has. And, and navigating through that complexity is not easy uh, in many respects. And farmers face also challenges of isolation, which could be economic isolation, geographic or spatial isolation, it could be social isolation, because of where they, where they practice um, their trade, out there in the hinterland. And the hinterland, as we know, them, at least in Africa, developing countries in general, is, is devoid of backbone infrastructure. <laughs> um, sanitation, schools, um, health facilities, roads, um, ICT infrastructure, you name it. And, and for me, that is where innovation should actually play its role. And I believe that um, digital technology is is important as a solution to deliver an integrated model because their problems are not only agricultural. They are social, they are economic, and they've got various dimensions. But if you deploy simple technology, which could be a cell phone technology, it is going to do things at scale, it's going to do things at speed. It is going to empower people to make decisions. It is going to move farmers from a position of maybe conscious ignorance of what the situation is to more, um, sorry, unconscious ignorance to more conscious ignorance. That will then bring them to change. The moment you know and you compare yourself in relation to the neighbors and in relation to the global world, you begin to see what you're missing. We know how the cell phone has changed the social lives of people. It can also change farmers, if you empower them with information, and that can flow through, it can flow through services, education, weather information, price discovery information becomes easy or easier. The second point really is my hobby horse on matters of equity and fairness in accessing resources, it could be land, it could be financial resources, and, and that can be solved by technology. And another one, which is much more fundamental, is equity and fairness in the distribution of risk and reward along the chain. We all know that um, farmers uh, buy at uh, retail and they sell at wholesale. 
and uh, they shoulder the highest amount of risk and the lowest amount of return, and, and, and the other way around. Technology can help make value chains more transparent and more accountable, <coughs> and can actually blockchain, I believe, can deal with that. Basic issues around the areas that you're farming on, which might influence the amount of inputs you put. You think it's one hectare, maybe it's half a hectare, then you buy inputs that are for one hectare, you over apply and you waste. And yet you can measure the, uh, your, the size of land using technology. So those basic examples to me are so fundamental to fix. And underlying that will be innovation in policy. How do you ensure that there's infrastructure, particularly infrastructure that delivers information out there to where people are? So that the moment they get information, I bet you they are going to change their behavior. And the moment the value chains become more equitable and fair, and they distribute fair reward, and they pay for, fairly for the ecosystem's management role farmers play, you'll see a big change. I stop here for now. Thanks. Leanne, do you want to tell us about some of the technological innovations that Nestle is working on? which you think can make farming more productive and also what's being done to make those technologies available to farmers where they need them. Yes, thank you very much and it's a pleasure to be here to talk on this uh, topic and I'm very happy to, uh, to follow uh, Ishmael because uh, he touched on a number of points that we are trying to address at Nestle. So, so first let me also provide a bit of context. We've been working on uh, how to create and, and drive food transformation prior to COVID, prior to the most recent events here in Europe, because climate change requires that. We need to find solutions uh, to this, our current food systems. So we were one of the first companies uh, back in 2020 to issue our climate roadmap, uh, but that's not enough. We also want to drive regenerative agriculture. And last September, we issued our ambition and how we're going to do that. We are dedicating 1.5 billion Swiss francs to spark all of these innovative uh, technologies and practices at the farm level to help that regenerative agriculture. Our ambition is to actually have 20% of our raw materials sourced through regenerative agriculture by 2025, 50% by 2030, and 100% by 2050. Okay, so what am I talking about then? What is this regenerative agriculture? Well, using science and technology, I can uh, give you a few examples that were touched upon briefly uh, by my colleague here. One is remote assessment technology, satellite monitoring. We've learned that satellites can help uh, detect and uh, control deforestation. We can apply that to soil. In France, we're working with farmers using technology, satellite technology, to detect soil cover. So cover crops. Why are cover crops important? Well, cover crops help maintain moisture in the soil and protect biodiversity. So increasing the asset, the soil, helping the farmers retain the value of that asset and, and uh, accelerate that production. Another technology are digital sensors, also mentioned. In Pakistan, we've been working on farmers to have digital sensors in the soil to monitor moisture levels. When the moisture is too low, it triggers irrigation, but only when it's too low. Provides us the certain amount of water needed, then stops. Prevents waste, improves the soil, improves the production. A third one we're using is public blockchain, working with uh, OpenSC where we're able to uh, follow in the Congo uh, the cherries, the coffee bean cherries from harvest all the way to the final product. We're doing that through blockchain and QR codes. And in fact, if, if you have time, go to the Nespresso site, look for our Congo Reviving Origin, and there's a QR code. It will show you uh, the farmers in the cooperative. It will show you uh, how much uh, and whether uh, how much they've uh, gathered. It will show you if they've been paid the premium for their work, and it will show you how it got through the ports, through the manufacturing facilities, all the way to the shelf. 
So using this type of transparent technology to connect the farmer to the consumer is part of the role we have as, as a middle player in that entire value chain. And one last example I provide is our income accelerator project for cocoa. And this touches on a number of things that Ishmael uh, uh, touched on. This program rewards not for volume, but for practices. So incentives for uh, using better agricultural practices such as pruning. Incentives for ensuring the children go to school. Incentives for using shade trees to help make more resilient the crops. Incentives for using other um, opportunities to have complementary crops. This is in Ivory Coast. It's part of our cocoa uh, program. And where does the technology come in? It comes into on the payments. So we're applying science to help regenerative agriculture, climate resilience, improve yield, but we're also providing the payments half to the male person of the household, half to the female member of the household using mobile payments. So readily available technology through cell phones uh, that enable uh, the whole community and the individual farming households to benefit from science and technology. So it's a, there's a real opportunity with regenerative agricultural um, projects to address not just the soil and not just the, the, the food production, but wider issues. And one of the roles for the private sector is to see how we can uh, prove out these technologies and systems, how we can uh, scale them, how can we make them cost effective. And uh, well, I could talk, continue to talk on the pieces that are all made to that, but I'll, I'll stop there for a moment. Thanks. Uh, so we've actually heard responses at two ends of the tech spectrum from application of blockchain technologies, which Leanne mentioned, to uh, simply making information available on the mobile phone, possibly just on WhatsApp. And therefore, Ishmael, do you want to build on the relevance that you see of some of the technological interventions that Leanne mentioned in a real life circumstance in South Africa or anywhere else in Africa? And whether you think that some of these innovations uh, can actually be applied by farmers in real time uh, in the months and years to come? Indeed, I think what she mentioned, I had already alluded to certain aspects of it. I mentioned earlier on that um, black, uh, blockchain technology can be uh, deployed to, to, to measure the flow of value and risk um, along and who is getting what when, when the product leaves the farm up to where it, um, it gets into the stomach, so to speak. Uh, so I see the relevance of that. It's not necessarily for use by farmers. It is to provide information to farmers to, to enable them to negotiate better because you might not know how the thing actually is distributed. So if it brings um, an element of transparency, then you can begin to inculcate the principle of fairness because things are now transparently displayed. So I see that uh, remote sensing is important and, and, and sensors are, are important. Um, I alluded earlier on to the importance of digitally measuring or um, by satellite the, 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 the plots of land that uh, farmers have for them to be able to determine the quantities in relation to running. So, so that already has application. But what also struck me um, um, profoundly, so to speak, was the the issue of uh, a practice-based practice type of reward system um, and, and not so much of volume-based because I think scale has been one of the major issues because farmers are not able to scale because of the fragmentation and, and, unless, of course, if they form a cooperative, which might not necessarily be the best model depending on the circumstances. So if you are able to reward also based on your practice and the practice is contributing to the general good of the, of the whole world. And of course, the whole world has to pay for the general goodness. It cannot be the farmer that pays for it only. Uh, that, that for me is important because of the smaller plots that they, that, that they have. Um, and also, if you are able to measure what actually is being put in the soil by way of carbon, um, the farmer might not be able to do it themselves. 
but if that, inf if that is available and that is credible and that is trusted, there's an element of trust here, and that the value coming out of that is going to be fairly distributed, things will happen. So I'm a chief advocate of technology uh, in, to be deployed to solve the problems that farmers face. Sometimes it's not so much of high tech, sometimes it's not so much about having it themselves, but having access to the outputs that technology provides. Let's build on that, because that's a very important thing, Shwen. It's not just the availability of technology, whether it is uh, the Internet of Things or drones, now some of those technology, technologies are available. Uh, Ishmael and farmers worldwide, especially small landholders will say, how do you make the technology available at scale, at low cost to the farmers who desperately need it? And their requirements may not be very high tech, it would be basic technology, which enables them to be more productive. Exactly, and, and that's uh, where we need to put a focus. How do we scale this? Because, I mean, look at what technology, existing technology can do today. We, we worked with, um, with, with uh, farmers in East Africa at the be beginning of the pandemic to see how could we rapidly increase the, the food production and with giving uh, uh, good access to, to, to input and through uh, cell phones, uh, both the smartphones but also regular phones to give the advice on how to, uh, how to do this agronomically. Uh, we, we digitally connected with 2 million farmers, 250,000 farmers were given uh, fertilizer and, and they were able to triple their maize yields in the first season. So, so, so the additional food that they were able to to produce was uh, enough to feed a million people for a whole year. That says something about the promise of technology and the quality input, what, what that can do. But then how do we dr drive scale? And this is where I think it's incredibly important that we don't overcomplicate, that we use convening platforms such as the World Economic Forum to, to get the full val value chain approach uh, to this and agree on some standards so that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, there is no common standard of even identifying something as simple as the uh, field of a farmer. How do we measure uh, soil quality in a way that creates predictability for the farmers? So let's open up. We have um, some, some technology here. Um, we're willing to, to give that away and, and share it openly, perhaps through the forum. Uh, uh, either way, wh whatever we can do to create scale and predictability for, for farmers and use what we have now to drive the change rapidly instead of super complicated technological or, or miracles in, in, in the future that will have impact five to 10 years from now, but what, what can we do now in the next season and, and, and really uh, combine all of this? Minister Mandavia, with every generation, land holdings in countries like India and so many other places in the world are becoming smaller. Uh, farmers are struggling just for sustenance. And given that, how do you see technology being made available to them to be able to increase productions uh, in, in a meaningful fashion? That is important questions because the farmers have time to time, time change the farming system. Number of all countries have for their self-farming tradition. Some countries as the farmers is educated, some countries farmers is not educated and more literate, some literate. It is, it is important things because the farmers without, without technology driven farming, it's impossible to fulfill to food security to whole world. So the farmers approach is always done by modern, technology driven and so we have taken to number of initiative in my country small and marginal farmers they can use to technology use to balance fertilizer use to to balance nutrient so we have started 7000 7000 all block have one modern fertilizer shop the modern fertilizer shop is given to information, guidance to farmers. Agriculture departments has organized number of events, number of seminars, lab to land approach, farmers, farm approach. Our scientists go to farm, 
or scientists go to village they discuss to farmers and farmers adopt to new technology enhance the production news our agriculture university is working on hybrid seed and which how their the the hybrid seed is giving too much more crop much more yield much more productions so number of type of action taken in my country so i have second time at that the marginal and small farmers it's very critical situations it's a uh, rahul ji has mentioned very well that it's a very small farmers have they want to use the tractor but they have no tractor what i can do because tra tractors they buy the tractor is very costly so the cooperative system we stronger in my country in co farm co farmers cooperative the farmers cooperative is buy the tractors and gives the farmers small farmers they use and cultivate for land this type of approach we have taken so our yield is increasing farmers generation by generations farmers is be, become small and small and marginal but our production is always increasing increasing now and today okay so i'm going to throw this open for questions uh if we will take questions you can think of what you want to ask i see two hands go up already so uh, can we take a question from the gentleman here please yeah Just let the mic come to you thank you very much thank you to all the panelists um, my name is martin schwab and i'm part of the global shaper staff here from switzerland in bern um my question is um as you mentioned all together um that we have to increase the production of uh, crops and so on and my question is to to all of you um normally if we look to the numbers we see that we already produce enough food for everyone on the planet we have enough to feed everyone and why is it still the the dogma to produce more and more and more and to 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 degrade the soil of our planet if we can reduce for example the meat production so we have more food for everyone why isn't this also some kind of uh, a new technology technological approach okay shwet would you like to build on this yeah and, and uh, of course uh, this isn't going to be solved just by uh, one initiative we have to do several things at this at the same time uh, but but uh, in terms of calories yes we're producing enough in, in in the world to feed the world but it's not produced in the right places so it's about producing more of the food regionally and doing that in a more sustainable way and indeed by by getting farming right we can actually reduce the farm line by 40% and produce enough food for the population but at the same time do that in a in a way that uh, protects the soil uh, through regenerative farming cover crops and focusing on soil health then you get two things at the same time one or several things actually more regional food production you reduce the emissions of uh, of agriculture which uh, is also important to to reach the, the paris agreement and the 1 and 1/2 degree uh target and you can uh, you can use uh, uh practices to sequester carbon in the in the soil and by having better quality soil it's more resilient towards climate change as well so it's possible to do all at the same time but it requires swift and urgent action now to to get that done and then of course diets uh, as well but you know i have to focus on what is it that i can do something about and that's more on the ag side to make that more resilient with focus on on soil quality and and more resilient uh, food production regionally so if you have a question just put your hand up and we can then go around the room the gentleman there wants to ask. hi my name is yusuf bilisami um i'm from the top link innovators i'm just building on on martin's question but looking at it from a whole different perspective what's been done on storage of fish because the amount of meat uh, waste from fish uh, in 2019 according to the field was 59.8 million metric tons one out of three fishes never make it to the table there's a lot that's been said on production uh but what's been done on storage and logistics thank you 
who'd like to take it? Leah, do you want to build on this? So, on in terms of, of improving, so yes, who, who wants to build on Ishmael? Not specific on fish, <laughs> uh, but, but on food waste in general. <laughs> but maybe before I, 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 I come to that, I just want to speak to an earlier question and just give a slightly different perspective. It's, it's a bit difficult to understand, putting it mildly, that those that are responsible for producing food are the largest majority of those that are malnourished or underfed. It's an irony that if we need to look at ourselves in our own eyes and see whether what you're doing is good, the ones that are feeding the world are themselves hungry. That tells a story about many things, apart from equity and fairness in the distribution. It talks also about infrastructure. You spoke about why do we keep on producing more and more. Most of the farmers farm to eat, and they, they reside in areas where they are not even accessible, even to go and distribute food to. So they need to keep on producing, and producing better for them to be able to eat better, because it's that food that is surplus is not going to be able to physically move to where they are. Hence the need for infrastructure. And that also can speak to um, infrastructure that is related to energy, that is related to cold stores. That is, that is also related to movement of fish, if I apply it to fish. Um, so so I, I think the, 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 there is sometimes um, not a proper analysis of what actually is, is, is the problem. Because yes, there's a lot of food. And yes, there are a lot of people are getting hungry. It seems like a very easy solution, but the equation is actually much more complex. And we need to differentiate and segregate uh, our solutions. And digital technology actually can help us understand which types of farmers would require which type of solution and which type of farmers would require not this. Sometimes we use the lowest common denominator to try and solve a much more complex problem. Let's use digital technology to understand the farmers that we're talking about. Most of them are not in the commercial realm, and they probably are in the safety net realm. But safety nets can also be deployed digitally to try and solve their problems. So it's, I think the innovation, in my view, is now in the thinking, in as much as farming is now much more in the head than in the hands. So see, that's where we need to be smart in terms of our solutions, uh, technological or otherwise. Thanks. Maybe if I could just jump in and, and uh, build a little bit on, on Ishmael, but also respond to your question. So I'm afraid I don't have the details on, on fish storage in our suppliers. But what I can tell you is that we are looking at alternative sources of protein, also to respond to your question, that don't rely on the same uh, agricultural processes or the same source. So. Uh, for example, we've developed a plant-based tuna, which, of course, protects the biodiversity in the sea, provides an alternative form of protein, uh, doesn't rely on the three most common uh, calorie sources that the world is relying on. That's part of the, the transformative food systems. How can we leverage other sources of calories, proteins, etc., and diversify? Uh, so it's not so much increasing, but transforming in terms of, of, of production. And then last comment I would make, you know, we see at Nestle, it's, it's incumbent upon us to, to, to be local, inclusive, and collaborative. Local meaning not the same solution doesn't apply everywhere. We need to re reflect and respect the local farming conditions. Uh, inclusive, leave no one behind. So the small farm holders, uh, the program I talked about with COCO, it's based on practices, not volume, because we want to include the small holder farmers. And then collaborative, we cannot do this by ourselves. We are working with all sorts of tech companies, NGOs, governments, suppliers, uh, other associations, because it, it needs the world to, to do this. So uh, I just want to share that with you as well. So we have time only for one last question. Rashid, yeah, go for it. Rashid uh, from Ghana. Um, it's a hybrid of a question and a just to seek your perspective as well. 
Um, we know that in terms of population growth, Africa is where the growth is happening, and the majority of the growth will be our young um, so, uh, demography. Is there a case that this challenge requires a change in narrative to try and direct the attention and focus of the young generation towards agriculture? Um, at the moment, it seems that everybody's leaving the rural area mm -hmm. and chasing white collar jobs in the urban areas. I don't know what your observation is on the field. If you could just share perspectives on this topic, please. Sure. Very important uh, topic, and, and I think uh, um, a, a large part of the solution here is bringing um, the next generation and, and young people into to agriculture to, 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 to also show that uh, agriculture could be something else than what it was in the past, and technology is the solution to that. So, so um, together with um, Strai Masiva and Agnes Kalibata, uh, I, Yara co-founded Generation Africa, which is really an initiative to drive uh, entrepreneurship um, uh, technology into agriculture and, uh, and really highlight individuals that are driving this next or the fourth uh, uh, agricultural revolution through technology and, 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 and really Im embed that into the, into the system because uh, today Africa f imports about $50 billion worth of food and it's growing because of the growing population. So it's, it's a captive in uh, regional market. It's a tremendous business opportunity, but it's only there if it's, uh, if it's seen. So we need to highlight that and get young people in and, and really build businesses on top of this amazing opportunity. Minister Manda, in a country like India, the challenge could be the converse, to get young people and others out of agriculture so that you have just the right number of people and ensuring that there are enough jobs available for them uh, for non-farming activities? So it's uh, only single solution. Make more profit profitable to agriculture, the youth automatic uh, automatically shall go to agriculture. But now the other business, other job get more profitable, so youth is diverted. So important, it's a, it's a important thing is, is it that why we, we can become to profitable agriculture? It's a big question make a profitable youth will divert to agriculture. Hmm. Okay, final words, yes, Ishmael. I, I, we have done a bit of work um, on that subject and uh, uh, the, the, the lesson that I think is coming from, from our experience first is that don't sell agriculture to the, to the young. No. Sell an opportunity. If you sell agriculture, they know that it is a back-breaking type of uh, situation. <laughs> It's a put. It's a put off. Sell an opportunity that is perhaps the largest sector that could have the largest number of billionaires. Mm -hmm. Sell entrepreneurship. Youth resonate with entrepreneurship. Okay. Youth resonate with technology. So a combination of um, youth uh, of entrepreneurship, um, technology, and a young generation is perhaps what the doctor ordered for the solution to be there. That's, that's my take. You know, we've had a fascinating conversation from the use of sensors, satellite technology, drones, IoT, to simple uh, solutions, like just making information available for farmers to be able to use that. And working on this collaboratively is critical, not just in a long-term perspective, but also in the immediate term, given the kind of challenges uh, we're dealing with on account of the geopolitical tensions. Uh, Mansuk by Mandavia, Shwen, Nian, and Ishmael, thank you so much for joining us and for all of you who participated uh, this morning. Thank you. I hope you had a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.